Welcome back to the committee, Taylor. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, my name is Taylor Jepson, and I live in Boise. I'm representing myself today. Sorry about the computer. Taylor, if you can let us know what bill you're speaking about. Uh, yes. So actually, most of them. Um, I will point out the specific ones that I'm talking about when I'm talking about them. All right. Um, so following the examination of these bills and the debate on them throughout the day, there are a couple points that I'd like to address. Um, so firstly, um, is just a plea to you as legislators to please consider the evidence that you're using to make these decisions and take the necessary time to make educated decisions. Rushing through something so important isn't going to benefit anyone, least of all you, because you're going to have to come back and fix it when the people aren't happy. Ultimately, that is the most important thing. You ran for this office, and the people elected you to it, but it was your choice to run. I understand that you don't necessarily want to be here all year, but it is your job to make sure that it gets done right. That being said, the debates here today have been severely lacking in fact and proof beyond conjecture and anecdotes. When other sources have been brought up, they weren't exactly reliable. For example, there was a lot of talk about VAERS data, which has been cited several times, but it is a not a reliable source of data, and the CDC will actually confirm this. It's about as reliable as citing Wikipedia, because ultimately it's just people reporting things on their own with absolutely no oversight from the uh, CDC. I know that I'm young, but I have been studying law since I was 10, debate and policymaking for at least as long, and have learned that the only way to make sound policy is by verifying opinion with fact, and neither unverifiable assertions or personal stories amount to that as applied to an entire diverse state, and that isn't something that you can legislate from. Secondly, and even more importantly, we need to establish moral and procedural standard that we will operate on regardless of the issue at hand. Principles should not shift on the political beliefs or polarizing issues of a specific case. If we are going to be pro-business and hands-off when it comes to economics, then we, that is the view that we need to take when approaching legislation, whether it is about taxes or health standards. If we prioritize uh, or advocate for freedom when making choices that affect our bodies and health, then we need to do that in all situations, even if it is proven that the issue in question will have a direct and dramatic effect on the health of one or more individuals. That applies to every bill here today. For example, 419, employees have a right to know that they are safe at work, and that's why so many laws around workplace safety exist. Um, Representative Mendive gave the example of HIV and AIDS, but HIV and COVID are completely different. A, COVID is airborne, HIV is much harder to transmit, and B, Idaho actually does require people with an HIV diagnosis to disclose HIV status prior to sexual contact with a partner, which would risk infection. And by is a felony. Ultimately, we can't compare those two. And if you want to use this in, as an example, it ought to ro fo reasonably follow that vaccination and other measures of immunity might be required to keep employees safe. Ultimately, morality is not variable. And I implore you to think about these choices about freedoms and think hard about the implications of the decision to apply that to all situations. Well done. Three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. Committee, any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative I Crane. Question. I I want to make sure I got your synopsis. So, personal stories. Were you saying that they should be a part of this process or should not be, and it should just be based on fact? Absolutely. They Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Crane. They should absolutely be taken into account. But ultimately, you can't legislate for an entire state based solely on conjecture. You have to be looking at the evidence and statistics that are actually valid, not just things that are self-reported and uh, just anecdotes that may or may not be true. Ultimately, while those are important, that's not something that we can apply blanket to the entire state. And a lot of the people who would speak against this bill can't necessarily be here today. So we can't apply that to everyone. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if a personal story is that I lost my job because they required that I take the COVID shot, that's not conjecture. That's fact. Right. And so you're okay with using that fact? It's not conjecture then in your worldview? What is it, conjecture or fact? Ms. Jepson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Crane. So in that case, that would be a fact. However, what I'm saying with that is that the second piece comes in. Um, what I talked about, about um, specifically relating to priorities. If we're going to be looking at that, we need to look at what we're prioritizing in this situation. Are we looking more at jobs or saving lives? If it's saving lives, will this actually do that? 
If the answer is yes, then we need to look at the evidence as provided by verifiable sources, not just things like VAERS, to ensure that we are making educated decisions on that. Once we have those kinds of facts from the people, then we can look at that as applied to a population and not just an individual. Thank you. Representative Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I was impressed with how fast you were in, in your presentation, so appreciate that. Um, my question is this. So you mentioned VARES a few times. Can you tell me who co-sponsors VARES? Yes. So that is a collection of... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. Um, Representative Nichols. Uh, so that is a collection of data that's done by the CDC. However, there is no verification process for ensuring that the information that's collected by that system is actually accurate. So it's like I made the comparison to Wikipedia, um, people can submit that information, but there's no oversight to ensure that it's accurate. Follow up? Follow up, please. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so in regards to that then, uh, who submits that information to VAERS? Ms. Jepson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Nichols. Um, so that would be the individual in question. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately um, that isn't necessarily always accurate. Um, just because I think that something happened as a result of a vaccine doesn't necessarily mean that it did. Another follow-up? Yes, Go please. Ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. And so based on that, as far as submitting information and making sure it's factual, who oversees that aspect of it? Ms. Jepson. Rep or Mr. Chairman, Representative Nichols, nobody does. Another One more. One Thank more. you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Okay. Um, and is there any other agencies that also uh, also co-sponsor the VAERS uh, information and site? Ms. Jepson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I haven't checked that, but I do know, based on the information that is provided by the CDC, that the VAERS database is not verified by any specific organization. It's just a collection of personal stories. And just a comment really quick. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you for your, um, your responses to that. I just wanted to note that, yes, you're correct. The CDC does co-sponsor that along, and I just pulled it up here, along with the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So thank you, though. Representative Birch. I like, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to make one very quick comment here because I'm looking at the VARES homepage here. And the, the entire homepage, the very first thing, is, in fact, the disclaimer. And I'm just going to read one sentence from it. While very important in monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. And it goes on for another four paragraphs. <laughs> so this is from VAERS itself, regardless of who sponsors it, regardless of, of anything like that. They themselves are making it very clear up front that there are limitations to how this information can be accurately interpreted and applied. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Jepson? Representative Birch. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm sorry, your, your name again? That's Ms. Jepson. Ms. Jepson. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, are you aware that just because the disclaimer says that it's not been verified, that the converse is also true, that it hasn't been unverified? Ms. Jepson. Mr. Chairman, Representative Furch, absolutely. However, I would say that it is unwise for us to be making such important decisions based on information that has not been verified one way or the other. And so we should be looking at data that we know comes from reliable sources, um, such as the CDC, which they have verified, uh, rather than VAERS, which has not been verified. Follow up. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Jepson, are you aware that there are other databases that are very similar to that, like the European database, I can't remember the, na the name of it, but these other databases around the world are showing similar spikes in reports of harm and injury, uh, very similar to what we're seeing with the US-based VARES. Ms. Jepson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Furch. And those may be better sources to look at than VAERS. Specifically, what I'm talking about is that the evidence that has been posited today in this committee is not something that we should be relying on to make decisions for the people of Idaho because it's not reliable. If those are more reliable sources, then I would encourage you to bring those forward so that we can, uh, as constituents, and then also you as a committee, look at that information and make decisions based on that. Mr. Chairman, yeah, so in your last comment, are you suggesting that it's the VAERS data that's not reliable or the majority of the testimony and comments we've heard in this committee today isn't verified or reliable? Ms. Jepson. Thank you, Chairman Dixon and Representative Furch. What I'm saying is that we shouldn't be betting the lives and livelihoods of all Idahoans on A, the testimony of a few people that may be coincidental or um, have nothing to do with the vaccine, or B, data that, again, is unverifiable. We should be looking at hard facts. I can tell you that as a four-year debater, um, and I did congressional debate, so I've done the same thing that you are all doing. Um, I won state in it as a sophomore, so I understand what's going on. What I'm saying is that if this were a debate round, this evidence would be tossed out the window because you can't prove methodology, you can't verify what the sources are saying, and ultimately it's not something that we should be using to legislate an entire population. One more. Okay, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Jepson. Um, you've commented that we should be erring on the side of caution. So let's say just a fraction of this enormous spike in reports to VAERS and the reports of death and harm are um, turn out to be verified because I do believe that the CDC does do some verification on the data that is inputted into it. At this point right now it's such a volume of reporting because of this vaccine that they are behind in their verification process. But let's say a small fraction of those are turn out to be verified of the 17,000 uh, reported deaths or so. Um, I mean, could it not be said that we should err on the side of safety the other way and not necessarily be mandating something that could actually turn out to be responsible for the reports that are going to the VAERS and the European version and other versions from around the world? Ms. Jepson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative, I think that you're misunderstanding me um, in saying that all bills like this are bad, that we should just let employers do whatever they want, that we should let the state do whatever they want. What I'm asking you specifically to do today is not to pass these bills because they are too hasty. We don't have the evidence and we haven't taken the time to really look at what the policy decisions are going to be um, in terms of how they're going to affect the population. So until we do that research, I don't think that it's wise to pass any of these bills because they haven't been planned out. Representative Barbieri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I believe you just stated my question. You are suggesting that we do nothing about these employees that are losing their jobs. Ms. Jepson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Barbieri, no. What I'm suggesting is that you take the time to make an informed decision. Because sometimes when hasty policy, policy actions are taken, I would say often when hasty policy actions are taken, more harm is done than good. We don't know what the effects of this are going to be until we implement it, but we can do research to find the best way to try to avoid the possible negative consequences that could come up. And I don't think that that's been done. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Taylor. And I want to applaud you. You nailed that three minutes. So um, you speak very fast. I, I do want to. You've already spoken um, on several occasions how we are rushing this through and through haste and uh, to get these bills passed. But um, I applaud you, one, for being here because not everybody can be. Do you believe in what, the way in which we're approaching this 
either it be in a special session and how quick we are going through these bills, do you believe it's keeping people, such as yourself, from being able to be present to actually provide their input? Um, we've heard from several folks who believe that these mandates are necessary, but we have yet to hear from several folks about how we probably should be um, limiting these bills through, how we should be voting against them and such. Do you believe the public has, in essence, because of the speed in which we're going through this, um, has been precluded from being able to participate? Ms. Jepson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Green. I think that that is a very accurate description. And I also think that it's important to note that most Idahoans, regardless of whether it's a special session or not, aren't going to be present when these committees are meeting, when the House is meeting, because they can't be. We have lives, we have jobs, we have things to do, and that doesn't make time for us to come down here and testify all of the time. So usually the people that you hear from are on one extreme side or the other. And my goal here today is to represent the middle ground who just wants to know what the truth is. Representative Clow. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Ms. Jefferson. Um, I was, I'm really impressed with your presentation to start with like everyone else has been. But I, one thing I have to say is, you. Th uh, the critique that we may be moving too fast or hasty is probably valid, but most of the people in this room would say that the, the federal government and governments in general and corporations have been acting on the same lack of information and hastily jumping in and passing these rules and mandates. And so if we sit back and wait, people's lives are impacted, whereas we can make a decision. Now, m many people in here know that I, I may not be jumping right on the bandwagon for ma um, stopping mandates and everything like that. But the point is, is that the reaction that's going on right now is because the, it's been interpreted that the vaccines themselves, the decisions have moved too quickly. Now, I would say last March, or not even, is it last March? <laughs> March before last, April, when uh, we, we start hearing reports of the first COVID cases up in Seattle and you know, yesterday, 10 people died in a nursing home, and it's like, oh my God, we're all going to die. This is 50 to 100% fatality. Everyone overreacted at that point and started moving forward. And many of us, and I would say myself included, were saying the government's doing the best job they can to try and deal with this. Now, it's been a couple years, and yeah, it's, it may seem hasty, but uh, there's been deadlines put out there by others. So I would just back off on the saying that we're moving too hastily and not taking some responsibility and putting it on the federal government and or any state agencies or corporations that have hastily jumped on the bag wagon of the statistics that they liked. That's my comment. Thank you. Ms. Jepson, do you want to respond to that in any way? Yes, please, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Representative Clow. Um, I would respond to that um, in two ways. Firstly, I'm not saying that we should do nothing. I'm, I'm not saying that we should wait a month or two weeks or even three days. I'm saying that we should wait until we can get the necessary information. I put this together while I was sitting right there. It, it can be done, and it can be done in a timely manner. I'm asking for it to be done, not necessarily for us to set a time limit. Um, secondly, if anything has come from this committee meeting today, I would hope that it's a reflection on that hasty government action. People don't like it. Don't do the same thing. Any other questions? Representative Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Taylor. So you're aware that legislators have been calling for a special session since yep. the 24th of August? Yes. So it's so over 90 days. These ideas have been circulating for probably at least that long. So I don't understand your argument how this is hasty. Um, when we were told we were going to come here, there was parameters set around the time, like, hey, we would like to try to get this done in three days. I could see that argument to you that you think maybe three days here is not enough time, but I'm really struggling with the fact that you're making an argument that these bills were crafted in haste like they were crafted yesterday and we're voting on today. So can you help me understand what you're trying to say with how this is done in a hasty manner? Ms. Jepson. Thank you, Rep or Mr. Chairman and Representative Crane. Um, a couple of things. Um, firstly, I'm familiar with the process of crafting legislation. Um, I've been involved with it for a very long time. Um, been working here for about four years um, in different capacities. So I, I know the process and I know that it's been going on for a long time, even just for this special session. What I'm concerned about isn't necessarily the haste, but the lack of preparation. Um, 
in terms of the research wasn't done. Um, so even though the bills might have been crafted over a long period of time, when I listen to sponsorships being given for a specific bill, I'm not hearing statistics. And when people are talking um, about the bill in committee or on the floor, I'm not hearing those solid informational pieces that are really going to be the impacts on the people of Idaho. And so that's what I'm concerned about. Um, the speed is a problem in some situations. This specific situation, the haste is only a problem because we're not allocating the time to where it needs to go. So, okay, now I understand the argument shifting from haste more to um, due diligence, possibly, um, or um, let me let me maybe say this another way. You don't have the this no. There is no citizen that's come to you that's standing in your office that's saying, Representative, I'm losing my job. What are you going to do about it? The emotional and the physical toll it has taken on these legislators has been significant. My office watches individual after individual after individual come and tell me, whether you want to call it anecdotal evidence, whether you want to call it personal evidence, whatever evidence you need, I got plenty of it. I've toured the COVID wings at hospitals here locally. I've seen the problem. So I don't have to sit around and do a lot of research to determine, A, there's a problem, and B, I'm elected to solve it. I don't know how long you feel like that that process needs to take. I don't know how many emails in mind that you need to see people that are frustrated that their government is allowing businesses to take away their basic fundamental right, that their personal property rights, their basic property, their body, they're being told what they have to do with their body. I don't know that you face that personally in the place where you are employed. And so it's very difficult for, for me to sit here and listen to you tell me how we're supposed to do this job. One, that's supposed that we were hasty. Now that argument has shifted that you guys haven't done your due diligence and you haven't done your research. I've done my research. There's a problem, and we're here to fix it. Now, you and I can agree or disagree on whether it needs three days or not, but the fact of the matter is there is significant problems that are going on in this state that should have never happened. Employers have done things to their employees that I believe are patently wrong. And that is why there were 30 different ideas from the House of Representatives to solve them and about eight from the Senate. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to move forward and see if there's any other testimony and uh, get on with moving these bills forward. Right, thank you. Ms. Jepson, any final response? Mr. Chairman, if I may. Representative Crane, I actually 100% agree with you. And I'm not here to tell you that you should not listen to those people who are talking to you because they are your constituents. And as I said, that is an important piece of this process. And I understand that you know that there is a problem. What I'm concerned about is that we may, <coughs> on not, not on purpose, certainly, but that we may take action because we need to take action without considering that sometimes that action can cause more harm than good. I am a public health major at BSU right now, and I study every single day the problems that exist in our healthcare policy. And many times, it's not because legislators didn't have good intent or because they didn't understand the problem, but because research wasn't done to look at the actual impacts of specific policy decisions. And unfortunately, a lot of that research hasn't been done yet because it hasn't been asked for. I'm not saying that you all aren't trying to do good, because I know you. I know that you are. What I'm saying is that, ultimately, we need to look at the evidence that, are, that is being used to make these choices and ensure that it's something that we can apply to everyone. Thank you, Ms. Jepson. Thank you. Jen.